Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. My name is Alex. With me, as always, is Noel. Hello. Julia, my wonderful wife, will not be joining us this particular episode, but we do have a very special guest, Julie Sidor. Would you please tell us about yourself? Hello. I'm a comic artist, and I've worked on a couple of web comics, most famous of which would be Snowflame, the fan comic series, bringing back an old DC hero who gained his powers from cocaine. And you can find that at snowflamecomic.com. And you can check out my art site at jsidor.tumblr.com. And my Twitter is at Julie Sidor. Awesome. So, Alex, what are we here to cover today? Today we are here to cover the latest installment in the Halloween franchise, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. But is it really an installment of that franchise? Or is it something altogether different? That is the question we will hope to answer tonight. Julie, as a newcomer to the John Carpenter podcast, our first non-Kevin guest, <laughs> what is your history with John Carpenter and your impressions of him as a filmmaker? I first got into John Carpenter films through watching Halloween 1 and 2. I was a fan of slasher movies when I was a kid. And I've seen a few other of his films, and I've always been impressed with the writing of the characters and then the directing. Very clear, very crisp, a lot of personality to all the characters. So I enjoy and what did you think of Halloween's 1 and 2? Halloween I've liked. I was originally a fan of the Friday the 13th series until one day my stepmom sat me down and was like, this is how it is old school <laughs> and showed me the first film. And I thought it was amazing. Everything I kind of like in slasher movies, just a very simple primal story that lets you kind of get out your worries about that question about what if someone does try to come into my house at night and, you know, what things crawl in the dark and so on. Mm -hmm. Just like the perfect movie for that simple story. And I enjoy one and two. And I did watch the others in the franchise and, you know, a little different reaction later down the line. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Halloween will do that to people. Yeah. It, it does. It gives and it takes. So Halloween 3 was released on October 22nd, 1982. It was the second and last Halloween film produced by the Dino De Laurentiis company for Universal Studios. The budget was $2.5 million, and despite being labeled a bomb, it pulled in $14.4 million. We've mentioned director Tommy Lee Wallace in the past. He grew up with John Carpenter in Kentucky before they went off to USC together. Wallace stuck with Carpenter throughout the 70s as art director on Dark Star and Assault on Precinct 13, and production designer and editor on Halloween in the Fog. Wallace had already started branching off in 1982 as the writer of Amityville 2 The Possession, but was looking to direct. He passed on Halloween 2 when he didn't like the script, and instead signed on to develop and helm Halloween 3. Following Halloween 3, Wallace continued writing and directing, only doing a handful of films and largely working on television shows like Baywatch and Flipper, as well as many TV movies. Other works I've seen are Fright Night Part 2 and his miniseries adaptation of Stephen King's It. Anybody else see Stephen King's It? A long time ago. Oh yeah, that was Tommy Lee Wallace. We'll still be seeing more of Wallace in this project as second unit director of Big Trouble in Little China, Carpenter's co-writer on El Diablo, and writer and director of another Carpenter-produced sequel, Vampire's Los Muertos. <laughs> Wallace is the only credited writer on the film, but there's actually a lot more to it. The original germ of a plot came from Deborah Hill, the first writer on the project was Nigel Neal, a British screenwriter noted for the television and film adventures of his character Professor Bernard Quatermass, most notably Quatermass and the Pit, one of John Carpenter's favorite films. Neal turned in the first draft, which Wallace says made for a good 60% of the finished film, but became very combative when it came to further alterations, so he was let go and ultimately took his name off the project. John Carpenter was the first to do a rewrite, followed by a draft by Wallace, and Wallace pretty much did write the finished version, mostly building on Nigel Neal's draft. The score was again John Carpenter composing it with his partner Alan Howarth, and as mentioned in the past, this is the last time John Carpenter would work with producer Deborah Hill until they reunite in 1996 for Escape from L.A. In the time between, she would produce The Dead Zone, Clue, Head Office, Adventures in Babysitting, Big Top Pee Wee, 
Not the first Pee Wee, the sequel Pee Wee. <laughs> Heartbreak Hotel, The Lottery, Gross Anatomy, The Fisher King, which I was surprised didn't nominate her an Oscar. The Attack of the 50-Foot Woman remake starring Daryl Hannah, and the Rebel Highway series of TV movies for Showtime, which teamed her with directors like Robert Rodriguez, John Milius, Ralph Bakshi, Joe Dante, and William Friedkin, and several of those she also wrote. So we've been asking, so what else was Deborah Hill up to after she left Garber? That's everything she was up to. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. All right, some returning names. We've got Jamie Lee Curtis in the movie as the voice of the telephone operator and loudspeaker. <laughs> we've got stunt coordinator and actor Dick Warlock. You know that character that Tom Atkins is fighting where he shoves his hand in the guy's belly and pulls out all the goop? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's Dick Warlock who played Michael Myers in Halloween 2. Nice. See, we've got executive producer Mustafa Akkad, associate producer Barry Bernardi, production manager Jeffrey Chernov, cinematographer Dean Cundy and his cameraman Raymond Stella, Clyde Bryan, and Tony Rivetti, gaffer Mark Walther, sound mixers Tommy Kazi, Bill Varney, and Steve Masla, sound editors Kendrick Sweet and David Lewis Udall, electrician Thomas Marshall, matte painter Sergei Genetempo, construction coordinator Walt Hadfield, location manager Ken Levette, hairstylist Frankie Bergman, first aid Maurice Costello, and boom operator Joe Brennan. Honestly, I, I would usually skip the boom operator, but Joe Brennan's been in like 10 John Carpenter projects, <laughs> so he deserves a mention. He does good boom work. <laughs> Appearing for the last time, this is the last of three films for executive producer Erwin Yablons, graphic artist John C. Walsh, script supervisor Lois Jaffe, grips Laszlo Horvath and Ronald Woodward, electrician John Antunovich, and actor Tom Adkins. Mm. Sadly, they never worked together again. It's a shame. This is the last of four films for sound editor Warren Hamilton Jr. and Wallace's assistant art director Randy Moore. And this is the last of five films in Masters of Carpentry for electrician Steve Mathis and actor Nancy Kyes. Ah. Uh. Nancy Kyes' last film in the series. Hmm. Boo. Actually, this was when she retired from acting and became a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's still a good profession. Yes. And then just three extra names to mention. We mentioned in Halloween 2 that Lance guest scored his lead role in The Last Starfighter due to Halloween 2, and Halloween 3 is what led beloved and prolific character actor Dan O'Herlihy to appear in that film as Grig. Don Post, who made the original Captain Kirk mask used by Michael Myers in the first two Halloween films, offered the use of his existing skull and witch masks for this one, co-designed the pumpkin mask with Tommy Lee Wallace, and helped arrange several of the scenes in The Mask Factory. And finally, visual effects producer Sam Nicholson, who put together the infamous Silver Shamrock commercial, <laughs> would direct the mid-90s Sega CD video games Midnight Raiders and Tomcat Alley. As a Sega CD owner, I say thank you, Sam Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> And then there was also a novelization, which Julie was, was kind enough to volunteer to read, and we will be covering that near the end of the podcast after we get through the movie. Okay. So why don't we just take a moment here to pause and just, is Halloween 3 a film that you had seen before? Yes, it is. I've seen it exactly three times in my life. Perfect number for it. Exactly, yeah. And I am familiar with this film. I had seen it before when I was about 11. Ooh, that's an age for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember some of my impressions of it, and some of those have not changed. And I've seen it, I think I only saw it once, somewhere in the mid-90s when I was in my early teens. Yeah, I'm pretty much, yeah, pretty much exactly where I was then in terms of what I thought of it. And I will say I was a little bitter about there not being any Michael Myers, but I have put that aside for tonight. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm sure that is definitely going to be something that we will discuss. But yeah, the infamous Halloween film that is not a Halloween film and yet is a Halloween film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing all kinds of flack about that late on the movie. Oh boy, the making of documentary on the Blu-ray where it just opens with this montage of everyone saying, it was a mistake, we shouldn't have done it, why did we do this? Cut to Tommy Lee Wallace, I thought it was a nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, Dan Chalice is the doctor on duty when a raving man is brought into his hospital, clutching a Halloween mask and saying they're going to kill us all. When the man's face is ripped open by a mysterious suited man who then douses himself in a gasoline fire, Dan wants to know just what in the hell is going on. The man's daughter, Ellie Grimbridge, shows up saying her father owned a novelty shop and had gone missing after heading out to pick up a pack of silver shamrock masks, which are a huge sensation and the subject of a massive media campaign this Halloween. Ellie and Dan head to Santa Mira, California, where Silver Shamrock is based, and find a bizarre town full of shady Irish folk and suited stone-faced men. At the factory, Ellie and Dan pose as a couple checking on a shipment, where they meet fellow buyers in the form of the Body Kupfer family and Marge Gutman. 
as well as the company's owner, Connell Cochran. Cochran takes them on a tour of the factory, showing the making of the masks, their distinctive company seal on the back, and Ellie spots a glimpse of what may be her dad's car. That night, Marge, investigating the seal on one of the masks, sparks a microchip within, which melts open her face and causes bugs to emerge. When Marge is carted off in an ambulance, Ellie and Dan sneak in to investigate, but Ellie is captured, and Dan discovers the suited men are all androids before he is led to a chamber where Cochran reveals the stone microchips in each mask are carved from a stolen block of Stonehenge, and Dan is forced to watch as a tape of the final ad campaign commercial causes the masked Cooper family child's head to melt open as bugs and snakes emerge and kill his parents. Dan is dragged to his cell and masked in front of a TV to await the national broadcast of the commercial, the final chapter of a massive druidic sacrifice that will kill hundreds if not thousands of children and their parents, but Dan breaks free, finds Ellie, and uses a crate of seals and a tape of the final ad to take out Cochrane and his men as the Stonehenge block glows. Dan and Ellie head out to warn the world before the final ad plays, but Ellie turns out to have been swapped with an android, and Dan doesn't make it to a phone fast enough as mass children nearby click through the channels and watch the final ad. So Alex, do you recommend Halloween 3, Season of the Witch? I do not. I was withholding some information before when you asked me my history with it. The first time I saw this movie, I despised it. Ooh. It did not make any sense to my young, continuity-obsessed mind why they would deviate from the Michael Myers path, so I didn't like it on that merit. The second time I saw it, I judged it on its own merit, and I enjoyed it a lot more. But this time, I now <laughs> see that its flaws have won out in the end. And there is stuff I do like about this movie, but ultimately... It is not a recommend. Julie, do you recommend the movie? I do not recommend this movie either. They obviously wanted to make this series into an anthology, and, you know, you can't begrudge them that. And I think the concept for it was just about as perfect a concept as you could have come up with, where it's kind of rooted in the real world. It talks about commercialism and what Halloween is like now, and then it makes a monster out of those things. I think that actually is a pretty good concept. It's kind of very basic and not too, too supernatural, which kind of keeps it some similarities with the first Halloween. And then from there, they could have bridged off into whatever other stories they wanted to tell. I think it's perfect for that, but the flaws in the execution are just kind of a little too much. I also do not recommend the movie. It's an interesting movie, and I can see why it does have the cult following it has. And actually, even from when I first saw it, I did kind of appreciate the idea of stepping away from Michael Myers and just doing something a little different. But it doesn't work. And Julie, you actually summed it up perfectly. It's a neat idea. It's a neat concept. Did not implement it very well. Despite the fact that it actually has some talented people on it, because this is still a lot of the same crew carried over. I actually skipped in my listing a lot of names. I skipped everyone who only worked on like two Carpenter films. Mm -hmm. And Halloween 2 and Halloween 3, it's everyone from the same crew. Mm -hmm. Costumers, you know, makeup people, hair, sound, gaffer, construction. But yeah, it's just a film that just doesn't work. A neat idea, but it doesn't quite work. So, well, why don't we just talk about real quick that idea of doing an anthology series? I love anthology horror, and I think it's a great concept, but it's really difficult with a movie like this that it's based around not one, but two films with the same killer in a atmosphere in the 80s where you had your star of the movies were, in fact, a masked killer instead of an actual protagonist. So it re I could see why people would have a big backlash towards the film. And then it's interesting that they then further extended it to it's the masks are the killers. And I like that. But again, where do they, what do they do with it? Where do they go with it? Exactly. They had a whole missed opportunity where they had the actual tie between the two films where they started talking about Sam Haim or Samhain or whatever it's pronounced in Halloween 2. And they could have bridged the gap between the two films where like a bunch of killers happening. And that could have led into the further anthology stories of yeah. Sam Haim bringing forth all this evil into the world. Yeah, that would have been nice. I mean, and my other thing is, I think this has one of the same issues I have with The Fog of this would make an absolutely rockin' half hour short. Yeah. Exactly. You are hit the nail on the head there. It's drawn out way too much with Tom Atkins running around a town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you could just compress down, take this, The Fog, come up with another third film, and there you got a three-part anthology movie. Yeah, every time he's investigating, the film hits a wall where it, there's not enough variety. It's just him walking running. around either an alley or the uh, factory itself, and, and nothing leave. is Duck going on. Leave. Yeah, exactly. Roll behind a bush. Hop but a fence. Yeah. <laughs> Action Tom. Action Atkins. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It'd be a killer New Twilight Zone episode, yeah. Yeah, 
They could have done a show, a Halloween show that was tied in like Friday the 13th attempted to, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, you could have put this on Amazing Stories. You could put it on Tales from the Crypt, Tales from the Dark Side. I think why I liked it when I was younger is it is a very Goosebumpsy story. Mm. Very Goosebumps, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is true. It's like he's chiseling off chunks of Stonehenge to put in Halloween masks that are going to cause children's heads to melt and snakes are going to come out and bite their parents. Yes. And there's like so many themes you had to work with. You had like children, what they do on Halloween. You had Sam Hain, you had child sacrifice, you have commercialism, you have old gods. If you just kind of work with any of it, yeah. I think it could have been like a really, really interesting movie. But I don't know that they pulled out the potential they had there. I'm just thinking of it now. I almost think it would have been an interesting movie if the mass just turned the children into monsters instead of just melting their heads and bugs come out. That would have been a killer finale. Yeah. I don't quite know where that idea comes from of the head melts and then just bugs come out. It's a gruesome effect. It seems pretty counterproductive. If you want the body count for this so-called culling or whatever for your sacrifices, you're taking a long road to that. I think there might be some ties to maybe older imagery where it's a fertility ritual that there's new life out of a sacrifice. I mm. think that's what they're pulling from. Not consciously. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I also think the fatal flaw of this plan is that it all depends on these big clunky pieces of plastic on the back of the masks that a good 80% of the children would have just torn off or cut off of the mask. Yeah, those things are going to be in the garbage. They're not even going to be playing with them with a bobby pin like that lady did. I mean, I would love a post credit sequence where it's just a montage of a whole bunch of trash bins exploding. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> and all the kids are fine. Yeah. Because it's like, honestly, if I bought those masks, I'm not going to run around with that giant clunky piece of plastic on the back. No, it's true. It's the seal of approval. The whole plot makes absolutely no sense when you think about it, when you factor in, like, time zones, the fact that none of these kids just wanted to be Spider-Man. Why do right. they all have to be these three masks? I mean, the ad is great. Why couldn't they just be running, like, demon blood into the actual latex? Exactly, yeah. Or get the kids, like you said, to turn into the monsters, and then they could just kill everyone who didn't have a mask. Yeah. I mean, that would be great if, like, Tom Atkins, like, running for help is, like, there's a bunch of skeleton kids and a bunch of witch kids running around. I think they were intending for the pythons and the spiders to do the heavy lifting because they killed the one dad. Yeah. I guess they were just counting true. on the snakes to clear a whole household. Yeah. And they're not even counting on chairs. Like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> everyone's going to be up on those chairs as soon as their kid's head melts. And I love how they play it at the end of a marathon where they're playing a movie that most of the parents aren't going to let their kids watch in the first place. Right. Exactly. Halloween. Yeah. Also, if there's one holiday where kids are not watching TV, it's Halloween. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, I like that they set that at nine o'clock. So it'll be by the time the kids have all come back inside. Yeah. Well, most trick-or-treating is done by like seven or eight for the little kids. And a lot of the times, like I was in bed yeah. around that time as a little kid. So I think the idea was the kids would run around with the mask, come in, watch the movie marathon. The marathon would end at nine o'clock before the local news. Kids would all put their masks on. But yeah, then that loses the whole chaos of the culling happening during Halloween. It's not. It's happening when the kids are just lazing about eating candy after Halloween. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the whole thing is to give tension that something's going to go down soon enough. Like in this day and age, it wouldn't work. It would just be a YouTube link saying like, please click on this. What happened next moved me to tears. <laughs> And then just the whole thing of, let's just steal the Stonehenge stone. I love that they don't even say how, he just has the line, you'll never believe how we did it. He'd go big yeah. or go home. <laughs> that he then, like, crafts the stone chips into microchips. It makes sense. <laughs> it's, a, it's an elaborate operation. It's true. I just get that thing to, like, blast everyone, like, turn it into a big Stonehenge cannon. Oh my gosh, Stonehenge death ray. <laughs> yeah, I actually really do like that moment at the end, though, where Stonehenge comes alive, and you have the whole circle of monitors starts glowing around all the dead scientists, and then Dan O'Hurley, he suddenly gets turned into, like, a weird white statue effect before he just fades away. Right. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't know how to end their movie. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> that's great. actually a great moment. It's just within the sea that is this movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so much of it's built around the automatons. Yeah, which don't really deliver. Which I like the idea of because he's a mask maker, he can make realistic looking robots. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense. <laughs> but they don't really build on the whole clockwork aspect very much. Just make a whole kilobot factory. Just make a whole bunch of those guys. You're going to get a pretty good sacrifice turnout. Mm-hmm. I do like some of the effect, though, in terms of just these bland guys in suits, like just walking into a hospital room and like pulling a guy's face open. Well, that's what Julie said. They're like for the commercialism aspect. They're like the yes men for the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I like a lot of the creepy effect, like even the one guy who's chasing him, he gets squished between the cars and the one guy who gets his gut ripped open. And mm-hmm. it, it's a neat effect. It's just kind of weirdly random in the plot. Yeah. And that's a very goosebumpsy thing, too. There's a whole bunch of toppings on this pizza, and I don't think they had enough fun with it. I think they tried to play it a little too seriously when they had a lot of yeah. aspects that they could have had a lot of fun with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that was the interesting thing about reading the script, and I'm not going to get into any differences here, but just the writing style of Tommy Lee Wallace, technically, him and Carpenter are very similar Mm -hmm. in terms of just how they block out a page, how they write a line. But while Carpenter's writing is very crackling and sharp and does have a momentum to it, Wallace's is just kind of lifeless and flat. And I find that translates to the screen very well in that a lot of the sequences are just kind of there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's not really much energy or momentum to them. Mm -hmm. Wallace is, I mean, the only other ones I've seen are it and Fright Night Part 2. He's not John Carpenter. He's a very workmanlike. Well, he has like these weird random ideas. Like this one had the automatons, all the weird things. Fright Night 2 had vampire bowling. He does have a lot of neat, weird ideas. He just doesn't know how to implement them very well. And he's mm-hmm. also very dry. Got his audio commentary. He seems like a wonderful, nice man, but he's just so flat <laughs> monotone. <laughs> and he just has so little energy that he exudes through his work. And it's strange in the beginning. I felt it was more Carpenter-esque than Halloween 2. I found the aesthetic very Carpenter-esque with, like, the screen and everything. Yeah. And, like, the semi-futuristic kind of take on it. Well, I should say, the guy who did the opening title credits, he was the guy who did the opening of Escape from New York. That makes sense. And did all of the uh, on-screen graphics in Dark Star. Okay. So he was one of the USC buddies. And then it's also worth pointing out Dean Cundy, who shot Halloween, Fog, Escape from New York, Halloween 2, also shot this film. So it's the same cinematographer, so it does have a very kind of similar visual look to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's always a very graphic look to a lot of John Carpenter's works from this time period. Rich blacks, close-ups will just be like, one side's in color. I don't know. In the cinematography, everything's just very easy to see. They use negative space very well. It wasn't enjoyable to look at, but Mm -hmm. yeah, there wasn't a lot of energy to the scenes. And it was very difficult to figure out like where the characters are kind of even coming from. I mean, seriously, especially when Tom Atkins was running around, because it's just like, let's just go get a shot of him on a roof. Let's just go get a shot of him on someone's lawn. That's true. Yeah. And it's strange because Tom Atkins can deliver like in Night of the Creeps. And here it was just kind of like going through the motions. Yeah. Let's talk about the leads, Ellie and Dan. Tom Atkins, again, like in Fog, I like that he is an unconventional lead Mm -hmm. because he's not a very pretty man, but he's also, but he's a very relatable guy. He's just kind of a normal guy, but in a very relatable way. And I think he does a pretty decent job here. He's just stuck with material that just has him running around. But then you get that one bit where he's watching the family getting killed on screen. He just like raises his fists and clenches. (laughs) Mm hmm. And I think that actually probably is the major flaw of the movie is there is no real perspective given for that character. I mean, you have Mm -hmm. your designing concept for the story, but the character has like no perspective, no motivation. I don't know what the themes are supposed to be with him. You know, just enough to know that he has kids, that he's a doctor, but you don't really even know why he goes on this mission. Is it just because he's that disturbed that someone died in his hospital? Is it he wants to have sex with Ellie? Is it just that he wants to get away from his wife and kids? You just have no idea. And then I think from there, from the flaws that I guess that he's a drunk or whatever, you could build something. But I almost think almost any other kind of character would have been better for this. It's kind of a generic detective story. And then Ellie is the femme fatale. Well, I think my problem is, is that it's not even his story. It's Ellie's story. Yeah. It should be Ellie's story because it's her father who's killed, her who's investigating this thing, Mm -hmm. her who has the ties to the mass shop, she who knows the selling business and the selling industry. But instead of like focusing on her with this doctor who's tagging along, they made it all, put all the focus on him Mm -hmm. and just had her tag along. And she's very much a prop in this. Yeah. And I just... The romance between them. Yeah, she's there to kiss him at just the right time. Yeah. Who knows why? It's a very flat romance. They have zero chemistry. And then the fact it's basically her story, but she's dropped for the entire last third of the movie. Yeah, they give her a real short shrift. And it's a robot. Yeah. And then it's a robot, and that just felt like minutes passing. Like, that scene almost did nothing. It was only there to take her out of the narrative, and that's it. And mm-hmm. I don't even know why. Why You could have had her screaming on the phone with him to shut off yeah. the commercials. Like, I don't know what was added by just getting rid of her. 
you don't even need to keep the focus on him for the climax because you've already had the scene where he calls his ex-wife and tries to get her to put the mask away. So you already feel that loss to yeah. him. So if you have him be the one who dies and she's the one who makes the final phone call, you're not still losing that beat. Right. Yeah. He really has no arc. No. All these characters seem to operate more out of boredom than anything else. Yeah. His <laughs> arc is that he's a washed up doctor whose ex-wife won't listen to him. And he ends mm-hmm. as a washed up doctor whose ex-wife won't listen to him. Very, yeah. <laughs> uh, to be honest, one thing I kind of didn't understand is the whole story is kind of about children Why not just make it a parent who's visiting the factory with their kids? It could have been their story because the children in this are treated like slasher movie fodder. Yeah, very much so. I think if you're going to use the trick of, oh, well, this is the movie where they killed the children, you should probably, I don't know, actually have that mean something. I actually just had a thought. Mm. What you could do is you can do the Janet Lee thing of like pull a psych out halfway through of the first half of the movie, play it like Willy Wonka. A group of children are being brought in to tour this factory. You also have this woman who's kind of off to the side and all this stuff. Then halfway through, the masks hit the children. The children all turn into monsters and start killing people. And then you realize what the backstory is of this woman who's trying to investigate the disappearance of her father. And so you have that shift of focus. You bring it in as a children's movie, and then you lead it off as a horror movie. As Now this has worldwide apocalyptic implications that she now has to stop having seen that. Exactly. One thing I was going to say is this is a movie where people visit a factory and a child dies from snakes exploding from its head. And that's going to happen even more children. And still, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is a scarier movie. In my opinion. (laughs) That one sends chills down my spine. No earthly way of knowing. Oh, God. There's definitely a problem with the story if the other is the scarier movie. (laughs) Yeah. It's a film with ideas, but no ambition. And I know part of the problem was, is that they did fast track this because they started shooting, I want to say just like two months after Halloween 2 came out. Mm -hmm. But I mean, still, this film went through four writers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you go through four writers and just that's the best you can get? Right. So what do we all think of the Silver Shamrock commercial? Oh, that's great. (laughs) Yeah. I do think that's the highlight of the movie. Yeah. It's catchy. I also really like the opening. The kind of pixel effect opening? It's creepy. The style reminds you of other John Carpenter films. And then at the end of the movie, you realize the flashing you had before the movie starts. That's the last thing Mm. that the kids are going to see. That they're supposed to see. Absolutely. That's right. That would not have worked on me as a kid, though, that thing. I'd be like, why are you not a silver hawk? I don't want you masks. Yeah. Yeah, one of the other things is I know Deborah Hill, part of her big original pitch was combining like ancient magic with modern high technology. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I see how those elements are in this film, but you don't feel like mm-hmm. there's any commentary from it. They yeah. don't really do a whole lot with the old fusion of magic. It's just Stonehenge is there, magic, bunch of screens in a, in a circle. Yeah. yeah. And robots. Yeah. And I like the robot aspect, except for Ellie at the end. I found that to be more disturbing than had they killed her off, that she's now just like literally a robot plot device for the Doctor. I think the robots for me, you kind of have this mystery of there's something wrong with the factory. You know that there's something sinister going on. And so it's kind of a mystery you're beginning to try to solve for yourself. But I think anybody like a third of the way through the movie is going to say, oh, are these robots? And then when you do, you kind of stop trying to wonder at what's going to happen um, because mm-hmm. now it could be anything. These are robots that look like humans. So, you know, there's just no point in guessing anymore. What if they were humans who had masks put on that like sap their will? There you go. Or if they had just been like cult members or if they were played a little bit more human. And then maybe they responded over the phone to commands like, you know, to kill the guy and then to burn themselves. And if you saw that happen and you really thought it was a human, that would be so disturbing. I don't know, it would bring a different level to these guys in suits. It'd be cool if you had like three suited people like pull off their faces and you have a witchy skeleton and a pumpkin. There's just a lack of play in this movie, I think. Yeah. For a movie that's supposed to be about, you know, tricks or treats. Well, there's neither. (laughs) There's nothing there. There's a lack of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. A lack of fun. Yeah. I mean, because especially a lot of the kills are very unpleasant in this movie. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, even just when he walks in and just starts poking the guy's eyes in and ripping his face. It's like they hold on it and they make it extremely squeamish. It feels like the robots are having a dick measuring contest with Michael Myers. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, seeing as one of the most prominent ones was Michael Myers. (laughs) (laughs) Dick Warlock. (laughs) 
whose name was Dick. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a film. It just doesn't hold together. I wish it did. It's a film that I want to like. I wanted to like it as well. Halfway yeah. through the movie until it started hitting like mega walls. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to give a soft recommend to this movie. And it just did everything in its power to uh, take that good feelings away. <laughs> yeah. And then they had to show me Tom Atkins' ass. I mean, come on. <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, seriously, how badly staged were those love scenes? They uh, were some of the most awkward love scenes I have ever seen. And they seen. come out of nowhere. Nowhere. They are super uncomfortable. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, yeah, this is just, this is a weird movie. I like the one scene of the woman picking at the chip and then it like suddenly zapping her face. And then you get the whole comment of, oh, we had a misfire. Mm-hmm. I like little moments like that. What's also weird is the script gets into this more. The film is basically Irish or evil. Yeah. It's an entire right. town full of Irish people. The bad guy is Irish. They're going to now <laughs> sacrifice most of the country. Mm-hmm. I know there used to be some old Irish prejudices back in the day. I don't know if, how much of that was still around in the 80s, but it's a little weird. It is the most anti-Irish film I've seen since Gangs of New York. I mean, the script will literally describe as they're going through the town and ruddy Irish faces scowled from the windows. Oh, it's yeah. Like, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> It's like, thank you, 1920s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a weird movie. It is a very weird movie. I appreciate it for trying something different and trying some things that... It does have a lot of really unique things that you just don't see in other movies. I'll give it that. But yeah, it doesn't put them together. And some tacked on kills, like his doctor friend who's yeah. doing like the autopsy. There's no reason for them to backtrack, nor do they have the information that that woman is going to figure things out with the synthetic parts in the fire. Which was actually a scene added in reshoots. Yeah. I was going to say that has to be. That feels so tacked on and so cheap. She actually only just had one scene and then they just added like three or four more in reshoots. Her discovering that has no bearing on anything. Like she cannot stop the plan at that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, you know, they're automatons. They're still on their pre-programmed missions. I guess so. I wish this film was better than it is. I understand why it has a following. I understand why it has its supporters, because it is different. It is an odd mm-hmm. little kooky movie. It just... It's got cult film aspects yeah. all over it, for sure. And added to that, the whole place that it has in the franchise. Yeah. This is a film I'd love to see a remake of, honestly. I'd love to see a new season of The Witch that tries to take these elements and actually does something with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that was a really good starting concept. You know, otherwise, watching the movie, a lot of it felt like events just happening. There wasn't Mm -hmm. a whole lot of significance or weight to any of it for me. Pretty visuals. I would like to see it remade. I know they actually have toyed with that a few times over the years. A new season of The Witch? Yeah. Well, and and then the Nicolas Cage movie came out, so they have to dump the title. Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Any final thoughts? I uh, needed a round of punch up, that's for sure. Like, have a few quips scattered throughout there. If you're going to be attacked by your robot girlfriend four flipping times in a car, <laughs> yeah. say something pithy, just a little bit. That was like an Evil Dead 2 scene. It just keeps going on. That's exactly what it was. Like, on the third time, I'm like, okay, I hate this, but if they do it one more time, I'm okay with it. And then they did. And I'm like, all right, but it needs a little, you know, a zazz. <laughs> I will say, we were very critical, Alex, you and I, of Alan Howarth's playing of John Carpenter score in the second movie. Mm -hmm. I actually like the score to this one a bit more. There's nothing particularly iconic about the melody, but I think it has a nice return to the Carpenter eeriness. And I think some of the beats and rhythms that he brings in actually kind of fit the clockwork mechanical aspect of certain parts of the plot. I agree with you 100%. I actually noted that, that I love the score to this one. I thought it was great. Oh, and by the way, Silver Shamrock commercial, that is Tommy Lee Wallace, both singing the song and as the announcer that, hey, kids. (laughs) Amazing. So, Julie, any final thoughts? Not really. Pretty much. Pretty much summed it up. Said that part. That sums it up. Yeah, I would say so. I think we deserve to give it exactly what it gave us. Very little dialogue of note. (laughs) (laughs) True. So, yes, there was a novelization written again by Dennis Etchison, who wrote Fog and uh, Halloween 2, under the name Jack M. Martin. And, Julie, you were kind enough to volunteer to give it a read. Do you want to tell us a bit about it? Sure. What we've kind of talked about with all of this is we wish that there was some kind of perspective, some kind of character weight, something to kind of drive the story and push it forward. And this novel actually really tries to do that half-heartedly, less so towards the end. But there is a very clear tone, and it actually does have the beginnings of setting up a character arc for Dr. Chalice. First of all, like the entire book is pretty much from his point of view. There's no added scenes. There's no jumping around to something that happens to like a guard. 
There's two main things of note about this one. The first one is it is padded. <laughs> Rarely have we ever read a book that is so padded as this one. I think it takes him up to page 25 to leave a room that he starts in. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Etchison's The Fog. The other thing is there is a very clear tone to this one, and that is one of absolute nihilism. <laughs> it is depressing and oppressive. The characterization of this absolutely plays up that he's a drunk and the problems of his recent divorce. Mm -hmm. And the portrayal of children in this one is actually really, really different. In the first scene where I believe like after the first two killings, it immediately starts where he's going to the kid's house and then the kids greet him and then they ask what he brought for them. But in the novelization, there's a good 10 or so pages where he goes out to a gas station and he's just dreading like he has to find the perfect things for the kids because he's afraid of like what his wife will think and he's afraid of like what his kids will think if he doesn't bring something to them. In fact, I can actually read a passage and this is part of the moral setup that they begin for him where uh, he hates his wife and he blames everything on her and he kind of has a lot of resentment towards his kids. And it's these feelings that kind of have the beginnings of an arc where he's supposed to learn better. Where he wants to save them. Yeah. Here's a part where with like Agnes, she was the nurse at the very beginning of the oh, movie yeah. where she's like, oh, I should have married you, Agnes. And she has a little bit more of a role in this where he thinks of her constantly and she's portrayed as being very pious, very helpful and very much a rock for him emotionally. Anyway, this is a part where he's talking to her. Want to get drunk with me tonight, Agnes? Thought this was the night you're supposed to see those beautiful kids of yours. He made a fist and slammed it into his forehead. Ah, oh, Jesus. You're right, he said hoarsely. That means I have to pick up something for them. Another peace offering. You know, it never ends. I never spent this much money on them when I was living there. <laughs> wow, what an asshole. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't want your money, she said reproachfully. They want you. Spare me. He pulled back his sleeve and checked his watch. And later on, there's a scene a few pages later where Agnes is basically talking to herself and saying she hopes that God can remove the scales from his eyes and that he can learn before it's too late. So wow. it kind of foreshadows the events that happen a whole lot later. And a lot of the book is him thinking about how much he hates his wife. It even describes her at a later meeting as licking her lips with her lizard tongue. Whoa. <laughs> And I actually think it's a really good portrayal of somebody who's so turned against someone that they once loved that they hate every single aspect about them. And you can also kind of see that there's things in here that are his fault. I mean, he misses picking up his kids. He complains when she asks him to spend any time with them and he's getting drunk a lot. Like it's easy to see that mm -hmm. the divorce is as much his fault as it was hers. And so you have this thing where he has something to learn. He has something to grow. He has an opportunity for character change. And when I was reading this, I kind of thought, OK, is this going to factor into trying to stop a commercial that's going to kill his kids? And it kind of drops the ball there. He doesn't really have any revelations later. It doesn't really change his perspective on anything. When he calls home to his kids, there isn't really any added urgency or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But there was the opportunity for growth and kind of what we wanted. But when I went into this movie, I was ready to be really, really angry <laughs> because the book is a rough read. <laughs> it's so depressing. Everything takes a very, very long time. And also, there's a little bit extra that Cochran has to say about why he's doing this. It kind of speaks to, I guess, some of the added pessimism of this approach. Yeah, because we never got that in the movie. No. Yeah, I mean, this movie, it's pretty light. And the parts where he's talking to his wife and is getting drunk are pretty glossed over. They, like, they just kind of make him look hard-boiled. And if anything, it kind of plays like she's just a nagging woman. It doesn't read that maybe that there's some part of it where he's wrong. The book is very, very different. It's not better for it. Right. I prefer, if I had to do one again, I'd prefer the fun, meaningless ride of, uh, <laughs> well, funner, comparatively ride of watching the movie. I'm trying to remember, at one point, didn't you tell me that the pace was so slow that it's like a noir novel where the femme fatale doesn't show up until halfway through? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She shows up around page 80, and the novel is 213 pages. 
So it's wow. like they padded out the first act yeah. and then just like roll through the rest of it. He starts a good chunk of the first part of the book in a gas station and also in a room where Agnes is rubbing his shoulders, trying to get him to relax. He's not even moving for several pages. His head is on the desk. He's exhausted. <laughs> At first, I thought it was like, did he take sleeping pills? Was there a suicide attempt here? Like, is that how... I love how... that you're concerned for the character of the book. You're like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. Tell me there's like an entire 20-page chapter of Tom Atkins running around, ducking behind bushes, hopping fences. No, Like, no. lovingly detailed. I wish it was that. It's not doing that. Instead, he's thinking about how his ex-wife is trying to be as mechanical a person as possible. Oh, like a mechanical person? Themes, themes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost kind of nor in some of how over the top some of its descriptions are, where uh, he wonders, will she successfully stick a steel rod up her kids' asses like the one she has of her own? <laughs> Wow. wow. The stick up her ass that she could lose any time if she could only unclench, but she's afraid that that would kill her. It's really oh over the top. Yeah, that, that's Dennis Etchison. Halloween 2 is full of nuggets like that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for reading this for us. <laughs> so we didn't have to. <laughs> wow. Ah, okay, so, I mean, it's interesting to try to read the story where... There is some perspective there. It felt like I was dealing with a character and watching to see where he would go for, you know, maybe a good third of the book. And then I realized, well, there aren't going to be any other changes. I wonder if it's just that he put a lot of thought up front and then just kind of burned out as he was writing. That could be. I mean, there are additions later. And I also don't know that he could have changed anything too much in the script. I mean, what I kind of thought would have actually, like, given the whole story some weight is after this first part of the book being completely pessimistic and he comes up against like the greater evil that is Cochrane trying to sacrifice the world's children, he kind of wakes up a little bit and he realizes, wait, no, no, there are things that are important. I have to save my kids. You know, maybe in his phone call to his wife, he starts saying things and like apologizing, just thinking that, you know, if he just says whatever she wants to hear, that she'll listen to him. But maybe while he's doing that, he realizes that some of it is his own fault and he has a realization and you could have it that she goes with it. And she's like, OK, OK, I'm going to tell the kids to take off her mask. You know, you hear her going and call the kids, but she starts screaming. It's too late. The hero learns his lesson too late. It's a tragedy. Story over. I think that would have been a lot more poignant and interesting. But, yeah. you know, you can't necessarily do that. It is weird that they end it not on the phone call with his wife, but on the phone call to the TV networks as he's trying to get it taken off of each of the stations. I feel like that's kind of like that third act stinger where, you know, he killed the monster that is Cochrane, but, you know, the monster raises its head one more time and then takes the kids anyway. I feel like that's what it was supposed to be. I do like the one brief moment of he gets it pulled off the station so the kid just reaches forward and turns to jail. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty realistic. Yeah. <laughs> that was nice. But the movie was just so lacking in tension that I don't think that last bit got me. Not enough tension, too much sweaty Tom Atkins just noticing a security camera and ducking away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you like to hear probably the ugliest thing in the novel? The one that made me wonder, oh my God, am I going to hate this movie completely <laughs> when I watch yes. it? All right. Tell me one thing first, said Chalice. Why children? Do I need a reason? Oh, I could tell you that they're the easiest prey, and they are, you know. People nowadays no longer listen to them. They provide the easiest entry, the path of least resistance. What better reason from a purely pragmatic view? But they are such irritating little creatures, don't you agree? You know that you do deep down. They're as noisy as wretched sheep and twice as dirty, given from us out of the filthiest part of a woman. And you know what happens <laughs> to dirty little lambs, don't you, doctor? They are invariably given over to the slaughter. Wow. Yeah. Jeepers. <laughs> I need a shower. <laughs> yeah. <I> feel dirty. <laughs> to take this movie and make it even grimier is just, yeah. wow. That person was going through a dark place in his life at that point. We can top it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I forgot about one other thing that happens. When he goes to take Ellie out of her cell, she isn't just going along and helping him escape like she does in the movie. Instead, she's been reverted to a childlike state. She calls him daddy. 
And at the point where they're dropping the creative badges over the ledge onto Cochrane, she kind of regresses back to a scene that she told him earlier about, where her dad hit her for letting go of a sad bird from its cage. And she asks, like, oh, can I let the bird go now, daddy? And after they escape and they're in the car, she starts, like, kissing him again in this regressed state. So it is gross. It is gross. Where did he even come (laughs) up? I don't Where know. Where did you even pull that from? Wow. <laughs> I, like, I don't know. <laughs> and so if you didn't think I didn't care for the movie, but I wasn't that hard on it, that's why. <laughs> yeah. I was watching this and I was like, oh, this is, you know, this is just some meaningless fluff here, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's not the heart of darkness. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Again, thank you for you reading the novel. Yes, on behalf of Masters of Carpentry. I have my fill of Dennis Etchison. <laughs> thank you, thank you for thank you for saving me from that. Oh God. And I, and I must say, that was an incredibly thorough analysis of the novelization. Thank you very much. You need to do something to improve your mood stat. You need to watch a bunch of Golden Girls. Oh yes. <laughs> Anyways, I think that brings our episode to a close. Mm-hmm. Our next film is going to be Christine, ah. based on the Stephen King novel. So thank you again for joining us, Julie. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And this has been Masters of Carpentry. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and have a great night. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. I thought we got more good discussion out of this movie than it actually deserved. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, getting water from a stone. <laughs> yeah. There you go, yeah. Or getting microchips from a stone. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Getting bugs from the face from the microchip from... <laughs> no. Oh <my> <laughs>